morning, and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. My name is Mary McTighe, and I'm the Forum's Vice President for Programming. This program is a special event for us this evening because it is a collaborative effort with the Bank of Boston. The bank has been a supporter of the Forum, and we're very pleased that they're able to co-sponsor tonight's address. We look forward to many future cooperative efforts. I'm pleased to introduce the Bank of Boston Senior Vice President, Ira Jackson, who will be moderating our discussion tonight. Ira. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we're extremely pleased to present the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. Dr. Elders, as most of you know, is one of the administration's most outspoken officials. She's known for her strong advocacy of sex education and child welfare, and she's said of her priorities, the principal one is to change the way Americans think about health by putting prevention first. Dr. Elders is the first African American and the second woman to hold the position of United States Surgeon General. What you may not know is that Jocelyn Elders is the oldest of eight children and as a youngster worked alongside her sharecropper parents in the cotton fields of Arkansas. She was raised in a three-room cabin with neither electricity nor indoor toilet and the first time she saw a doctor was during her first year in college. Dr. Elders was graduated from Philander Smith College in Little Rock at age 18. After serving in the United States Army, she attended the University of Arkansas Medical School on the GI Bill. A pediatric endocrinologist and professor of medicine, she came to the Surgeon General's office by way of the Arkansas Department of Health, where she served as director from 1987 to 1992 under then Governor Bill Clinton. During that time, she was credited with increasing the childhood immunization rate, broadly expanding HIV testing and counseling services, and increasing breast cancer screenings, especially for low-income women. Tonight, the Surgeon General will focus on the administration's plan for universal health care and what it means for us. Passionate and persuasive, she brings to the nation and to Boston tonight a wealth of experience, years of caring, and an unyielding commitment. On behalf of the bank and the Ford Hall Forum, please welcome Dr. Jocelyn Elders. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this year's forum for inviting me to participate. I'm very humbled when I review the history of the many speakers that you've had before me, each covering major pieces of reform, a major kinds of crises that may have been going on in our society at that particular time. And again, I feel tonight I'm here talking about another crisis that we are having in America today. I know many of us may not feel that we really have a health care crisis in this country, but I feel that we, in fact, do have a health care crisis for many of our people. When we have 39 million Americans who have no access to health care, when we have 81 million Americans who may uh, it be on, uh, have caps put on their insurance or might not, or have pre-existing conditions which would prohibit them from getting insurance, then that says to me that we, in fact, may have a crisis in our country. And I feel that we have to deal with those crises. When we begin, if you want to think back and look at when we've had major crises in the past, I think one of the things, we, if we look at the, in the early 1900s, we had what we call a progressive era. But then in the 30s, we had the Great Depression. And out of that Great Depression was born, if you will, the New Deal and Social Security. 
Then in the 60s, in fact, it's thought that about every 30 years, we have a window of opportunity, a window of opportunity for reform. Dr. Phil Lee, the Assistant Secretary of Health, has really been a great proponent of this theory. But in 1964, out of the civil rights crisis was born the Civil Rights Act. We also had born during that time because of the loss of health care for many of our elderly and bankruptcy, Medicare and Medicaid to provide health care for our senior citizens and for our poor. Now it's 30 years later. It's 19. 94. It's time for another major window of opportunity in domestic policy. And we hope that this window will offer us, or give us the opportunity to have health care reform such that all Americans would have a right or an opportunity for health care. President Carter once said that in our society, we have many times witnessed the impossible. And when you think about it, let's think, we've witnessed in the past few years the death of communism. We witnessed the integration of South Africa. We witnessed from our living rooms a man on the moon. And we watched from our living rooms the war fought in Desert Storm. Yet we've not accomplished many things which we all feel are very possible in the area of health care. We've not been able to immunize our children, and we all we have the immunizations. We know where they are, we know that they make a difference, and yet only 44% of all the children in America under two years of age are completely immunized. That is a real problem. We have not eradicated the disease caused by smoking, and we've known for 30 years that this is bad and damaging for your health. We've had the availability of birth control pills and condoms and other methods of contraception available for a long number of years, and yet 57% of all the children born in America are unplanned, unwanted children. That says something about our society that we've accomplished the impossible, but we've not been able to make the possible things that we know how to do and can happen. I think everyone in this room agrees and feels that every American should have a right to health care. I've often made that statement when I've talked to lawyers, and I had, but at one, one occasion, I had a lawyer stand up and ask me, says, Dr. Elders, who gave them that right? Well, I feel if every, I, I couldn't, didn't know what to say for a minute, but then I thought about it, and I said, if you lawyers feel that every criminal has a right to a lawyer, why shouldn't every sick person have a right to a doctor? And I feel that we need to make sure that all of our citizens have a right to health care. The only group that has a constitutional right to health care in America today are our criminals. So we need to make sure that all of our citizens have that right. Our present health system, our health care system, is really a patchwork of services. It's not coherent, it's not comprehensive, it's not well coordinated, it does not offer choice to all of our citizens, it certainly does not offer choice to people who have no insurance, it does not offer choice to people who've lost their jobs, 
It does not offer choice to people who are working and get a terminal illness and lose their insurance because they're sick. What we have, and in many ways it's not equitable, and it's certainly not universal, what we have is a very expensive sick care system rather than having a health care system. We spend 14% of our gross domestic product, which is $940 billion a year. And out of that $940 billion a year, less than 1% Less than 1% is spent on health, on keeping people healthy. We're talking about for immunizations, for prenatal care, for health education, and for many of our clinics that try and keep people healthy. So we've got to invest more in keeping people healthy rather than paying for a very expensive sick care system. We've got the best doctors in the world, We've got the best hospitals in the world. We've got the best nurses. We've got the best high technology. But we do not have the best health care delivery system. We spend 14% of our gross domestic product. Canada spends 10%. But the thing of it is, Canada spends $3 on public health, on keeping their people healthy, for every $1 we spend. Several years ago, the Institute of Medicine did an analysis of our public health system in America, and what it said, that it was in dire straits and in mass disrepair. It was underfunded, the uh, infrastructure was rotten, the leadership was not well trained and that we needed to make a major infusion into this system in order to improve the health of our community. And so we need not only, when we look at reform, we need to look not only at reforming our sick care system, we've got to inform, reform our community health system. We've got to make our communities healthier if we want to improve health care and reduce the cost of our system. When we began to look at what do we want and ask, well, what are we looking for in health care reform? What must it do? Well, I think one of the things that it must do, at first it must strengthen, if you will, our sick care system and make sure that all of our people have access. Well, in fact, now many people already have access because here in Boston, if you get sick enough, it makes no difference whether you have a way to pay or not, you will get care. Every hospital will take care of you. They may be rushing trying to get you someplace else but they will make sure that they get you patched together until they can get you somewhere else. So we pay for the most expensive form of health care today. But we, what we don't have is a primary preventive health care system to make sure we keep our people well and keep them healthy. When we look at the problems related to access, so one of the things we want is access. Well, first of all, we have to, in order to have access, we have to think of four things. We have to think of financial access, and I think that that's what we've talked about a lot and you've heard a lot about. We have to make sure that we have provider access, that we have to train the doctors that we need or the kind of doctors we need to provide access to health care. Now we've got too many specialists and not enough generalists. Our doctors are in urban areas, and our people live in rural areas. So these, and many of them, are our people are often in inner cities, and our doctors are in suburbia. So we have got to make sure that we have our providers where our people are, and are providing the services that we need. The other thing that we've got to make sure is that people have cultural access. The uh, Dean of Public Health at Boston, at um, 
Johns Hopkins was saying that the highest area of blindness related to cataracts in the world was in a two mile radius of Johns Hopkins. This is an area, they have the Eye Institute, they have some of the more and the best doctors in the country for taking, doing eye surgery. They are within a two mile radius. Most of these people are over 65. So they really have a way to pay, but yet they're not accessible because they don't know. So we've got to make sure that our people know what the services they need are and provide those services. The other problem that we've run into in many of our rural areas and inner city areas is transportation. Often we don't think about the problem with transportation but we've got to be able to pick our people up and get them to service. If we can't put a doctor in every community, we can certainly hire a bus driver to go pick people up and bring them to the doctor. It's a lot cheaper to train a bus driver than it is to train a doctor. So we need to make sure that we can look at all of these factors in making sure that our people have access, uh, access to care. So in addition to strengthening our basic health care system, we've got to strengthen our public health system and we've got to make sure that we in many ways control the cost because our present system, it costs too much and it delivers too little. And those are some of the problems that I feel that we've got to solve if we're going to improve our overall health care system. We know that this is a, a very important thing that we've got to do. All of the systems that are presently being looked at in Washington, I can tell you that they most, uh, there are three that offer universal coverage or universal care. That is the President's Health Security Act, that is uh, the, uh, the single payer plan, and that's the start modification, if you will, of the President's uh, Health Security Act. So those are some of the, those are the three universal plans. There are uh, other insurance modifications. There are things that look, if you will, at, um, but, uh, how the delivery is, is be modified or there are gradual uh, programs, but the president has said that he's only going to sign a plan that offers, if you will, a universal coverage. Well, what should be the role of the federal government in looking at universal coverage? First of all, I think the federal government has to choose a financing mechanism. How are we going to pay for it? We can, there, what the things, we can look at employer mandates. You know, the president's plan says that we're going to have 80, the employer would pay 80% and the uh, employee would pay 20%. No employer would pay more than 7.9% of his payroll. No employee would pay more than 3.9% of their wages. The rest would be subsidized. Well, I don't know whether we're going to end up with the employee mandates or not because there is a lot of argument about employee mandates. We can raise the income tax or raise some other tax in order to pay for the single payer. We've talked about the excise tax and we've all talked about the sin tax, you know, the cigarette tax and things of that sort. The other thing, they must make sure, the federal government must make sure that there is adequate support for the system. That is, we must be able to have community ratings, open enrollments, no pre-existing conditions, no caps. We've got to provide, make sure the services are available for all of our citizens. And it's got to be able to support the training of doctors, undergraduate medical education, the training of nurses. We've got to make sure we have the kind of doctors and the kinds of services that we need to make a difference. The other thing we've got to do is we've got to contain costs. And we've got to make sure that we offer high quality. We want the same kind of quality that we've always had. And the last thing the federal government has to do is make sure that we have a standard benefits package that's available for everyone. So I think that those are some of the things. But what are some of the problems that we're facing in addition to the problems that with just medical care? 
I think some of the problems that we're facing with our bright young people are, first of all, are the social and behavioral problems that are influencing the health of our nation that we've got to deal with. Things like drugs, alcohol, smoking, teenage pregnancy, AIDS, all of these social problems are impacting, if you will, the health of our nation and costing us a fortune. We spent last year $34 billion on AFDC, WIC, and Medicaid for children born to children. So we've got to make sure we began to deal with those problems. So we've got to change the way we look at our health care system, change the way that it's financed. We've got to look and change the way that the health care is delivered. And we've also got to make sure that we have very high quality services out there if we're going to do the things we need to do. We've got to reduce the paperwork that's involved in the system. And I think that one of the most important things that we've got to do is we've got to prevent the problems that we're seeing. And how are we going to do that? What are some of the things that we're going to do that can make a difference and prevent the problems? What are some of our strategies, if you will, to make sure that we have or accomplish reform? I think first and most important, we've got to educate our people. You can't keep people healthy if they aren't educated. And you can't educate them if they're not healthy. I feel that we're going to have to have comprehensive health education programs in our schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. We are going to have to educate parents on how to be healthy. We are going to have to make sure that we start early. And I was talking with your bankers today, and they were talking about their program of success by six. We know that if we're going to improve the health of our population, we've got to make sure that we start early. We're doing too little, too late. The other thing that I feel that we uh, must begin to do is we've got to make services available where our people are. And we, a big part of the president's program is to make sure we have school-based health services out where our children are, such that they can receive the services that they need. And lastly, but we've got to offer our bright young people hope. But what are the things we must do if we want to focus, if you will, on prevention or on prevention strategies? How do we do it? What are the things we must be about? First of all, I think we have to design and develop programs and policies that focus on prevention. We've not done that. We have put all of our efforts into intervention. The other thing is I think we've each got to reach out and be responsible and use all of the resources that are out there and available to us. We've got to use our medical schools. We've got to use our schools, our churches, our business. And again, I find here in this community, many of your businesses are getting involved to make a difference and to try and keep people healthy. We've got to educate. Educate. We've got to educate ourselves, educate our schools, educate our people that are involved. And people like yourselves for the B, B in prevention will have to be the voice and the vision of the poor and the powerless. You know that even though people will have their card, if they don't know and they aren't aware of the services, they can't begin to get the services. So we will have to make sure that those services are available. And for many, we've got to offer translation services for many of our people, daycare services. So those are all things that we have to be about. We've got to empower our people to take care of themselves. You know, many times it's a lot easier for us to train somebody to not do something, to not smoke, not drink, not drive while drinking, than it is to fix them up after they've had a major accident. We've got to network and all begin to work together to make this happen. We can't do it. No one group can do it alone. We've all got to work together. We've all got to be behind it. The doctors, the nurses, the schools, all of us. In order to make it happen, we're going to have to use our tools of commitment. We've been concerned about health care, but I feel we've got to be committed. We can no longer stand as the only nation, along with South Africa, as being the only nation without health care. We've got to make sure that we offer all of our people health care too. The tools of commitment are time, 
talent and our treasures, and we've got to give of all of those that we are going to serve and take care of all of our people. We've all got to get involved. We've got to invest in the future. For the O in prevention, we've got to use every opportunity we get to make a difference. And again, we all have our fingers out in different pies, and we have to make sure that we do that. And we've got to do it now. I feel that we have a wonderful opportunity now. You have a president in the White House that's committed to making health care ha uh, happen for everybody. You've got a first lady that has a real commitment. You've certainly got a Surgeon General that's very committed to making sure that health care is available and accessible of high quality for all Americans. So we have got to push to make it happen. We can't wait another generation. And I've always said, and since I've been your Surgeon General, I feel that it's been out like dancing with a bear. I want you to know that when you're dancing with a bear, and I feel that this health care problem is like dancing with a bear, you can't get tired and sit down. You have to wait until the bear gets tired, and then you sit down. I feel that we all must work together to make health care reform a real reality for all of our citizens, and it will depend on each and every one of us doing the things that we know we need to do in order to make that happen. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions at this time. Thank you. The uh, Declaration of Independence uh, mentions uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think, uh, I've just thought and listened to you speak, that the fundamental problem uh, is that uh, people pursue happiness and in a democratic society. Many people know that junk food is bad for them. People know that condoms should be worn. So do you think that you know, unless we have a dictatorship, that you can truly have universal health care because a lot of people are just never going to make the decisions and, and, but which they know to be in, in the interest of good health. Well, I think we certainly can't, I don't feel we, we're about a dictatorship, but I feel that we can educate our young people on how to be healthy. We can talk about good nutrition. If we look at how much we spend on nutrition education for our very young people, we spend only $5 million for nutrition education mm -hmm. for all the children in America. Mr. McDonald spent $40 million advertising his Big Mac. So I'm saying that we've got to educate our children on how to be healthy and make good decisions, and we have to start early. We've been doing too little too late. We know that we haven't taught young people to exercise by the age of 10. They will probably never really get involved in exercising vigorously. We know that if we teach young people against smoking, just one class in uh, or very early, the third, you can reduce smoking 37%. So I'm saying that we've not had a comprehensive health education program in our schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. What we do is we give them five hours, we, you know, we teach, uh, we, children have from K through 12, they have uh, 12,000 hours of reading, writing, and arithmetic, and they only have 43 hours of how to take care of their bodies, the most important thing they'll ever have to do. Thank you. Um, Dr. Elders, if universal health care is passed, what role would there be, if any, for neighborhood health centers and McKinney health care for the homeless? Well, as you know, all of the homeless and all of the, you know, would, would also have a card, you know, so they could really get health care. But the uh, community health centers, the migrant health centers, the health departments, and the uh, McKinney uh, Health Care Centers for the Homeless would still be funded. In fact, uh, maternal child health, family planning, all of these would still be out there, and they could go to different doctors as, and, you know, and be seen as an essential community provider. So they could certainly still get health services. You know, now they're seen, and they're really, you know, in hospitals 
are, do not, are not often not paid. But all of the homeless would also have a point of service. Wherever they show up, they could get care. Dr. Elders, I have a question about medical research um, and whether that's addressed in the, in the program at all. Um, for an example, prostate cancer is something that obviously affects men and there is a blood test for it. Um, breast cancer affects women. There is no easy test for it um, and it has very high um, or very low survival rate. Um, so I'm wondering, is there a way to get research where research is needed and um, whether that's something that's being addressed? Well, yeah, I think that uh, certainly mammograms are covered with no copay whatsoever and there is a test for certain type, at least one single type of inherited breast cancer in women. And you know, one of the things, this is why I feel education is so absolutely important. Even today, less than 50% of the women over 50 in the United States have ever had a mammogram. That's education. We've got to teach our women how to get services, where to get services, and make them available, you know, uh, and make them available to them. So, uh, yes, research, there is a $1 billion in, put in for uh, prevention research. In addition, uh, the research that's been done at the National Institutes of Health will continue to be uh, funded, at, you know, at better levels, and certainly research for, on women. All of, research, all of the research that's being done are looking at cross-cutting issues involving women. So uh, yes, that will, research will continue to be a major part of the health care reform package. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elders, I am interested in the Wellstone McDermott plan for long-term care. Under this plan, people over 65, if they were able to, would pay $65 a month for long-term basic care protection. I believe that this could get through the House, but I feel that Senator Paul Wellstone will have a hard time getting it through the Senate. I wish that you could help him along with it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You know, uh, the, the plan that she brought up was the single payer uh, plan. And uh, again, I think that uh, we'll need a lot of help from all over the country. You know, everybody will have to work on their individual uh, senators and house people at home. Thank you very much. So I'd like to make a few points. First of all, I am the state coordinator for a patient's rights group. And um, I see the problems a little bit differently, and we don't always hear all of the issues. I'm also a third grade teacher, and as a teacher, I think we have to deal with honesty. I think a lot of the people in this country who are having difficulties right now are the people who are well insured. They are working and they have insurance, and they're being manipulated by insurance companies, and they're having a very difficult time accessing the system. The second point that I'd like to make is that I agree with you on education. We are not educated on how to access information. And it's not just preventative care. Many of the procedures and surgeries that are performed in this country are unnecessary. And many of them lead to iatrogenic problems. Iatrogenic means treatment or doctor caused. People who suffer from these conditions do not have a legal system that protects them. There is no accountability there is no oversight. I deal with these people daily. There is nowhere for us to go, and I would like Hillary Clinton and the President to address this issue. How do you feel about uh, accessing the information on the National Practitioner Data Bank and making that available to the public so that we will know information that will help us to make wise medical choices? Thank you for your question. Uh, that's exactly a part of the President's plan, is to make, you know, have data available and have data available about all the plans so people can make decisions based on the data which they have. You, you know, I think some many of the things that you've said are correct for certain, you know, but I think that, you know, we can't generalize to everybody. And, and so I feel that in that sense, unless we collect the data, we can't have it. But you know and I know, Collecting data is very, very expensive. So, in or, but in order to be able to have the quality 
data to be able to tell you how your plan works. Well, we'll you know, we will have to collect that data. Thank you. Uh, Medicare is a, a very popular program and it's accepted generally by the American people. Why don't they just expand Medicare, call it Medicare, and we've got it solved? <laughs> well, I think that uh, that was a part of what uh, 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 Senator Stark, our uh, representative, Stark, was really talking about. What he was saying is that everybody that had private insurance keep their private insurance, and everybody that had uh, didn't have insurance could have at least if they called Medicare Part C or something like Medicare for the people who did not have access or did not have uh, insurance. So uh, I think that that's certainly one of the things that's being looked at now. I don't, you know, I think we'll probably get some form of universal health care, but I don't know what it will be. Dr. Elders, I'm a member of the Alliance for the Mentally Ill in Massachusetts. Um, mental illness affects one in five families. Um, in Boston alone, we have over 2,000 mentally ill on the street, the majority of whom have been deinstitutionalized with no community care follow-up. Um, persons with schizophrenia occupy more hospital beds than any other illness. I'm just wondering how mental health benefits are going to be incorporated into the health care reform package. Okay. Well, I think you know what's there, probably already know what's there now. The reason why you asked the question like you framed it, and that's uh, 30 days of hospitalization plus 30 outpatient visits. And then there is a possibility, obviously, if a person has a significant or severe mental illness, to get waivers of psychiatrists to get special special waivers for that. Good evening, Dr. Elders. Thank you for addressing us this evening. Um, I value your comments on education, educating our children, but I wonder if we should not only focus on educating our children on AIDS and nutrition, but really should address, address our social ills of our society and that it really goes right down to the family and to recognizing our spirituality and recognizing our need to work together. And I was wondering if you could comment on that and if you feel there's an importance on that and if you feel that might take well, I feel very strongly that we have to do multiple, you know, we have to do multiple things that no one intervention works. It's kind of like a, a multi-headed dragon. We've got to attack all of these problems, otherwise we will not find an answer. I feel that, you know, we charge and want every church to get out and do all the things that they can to try and make a difference. In fact, my brother is a United Methodist minister, and I've charged him to stop moralizing from the pulpit and preaching to the choir, I needed them to get out in the streets and go to work. So we've all got to work on this particular problem. And I mentioned nutrition and I mentioned AIDS, but we, I feel that we've got to have a comprehensive health education program in our schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. If we do not do that, we will not improve the health of America. And that's what we have to be about. But the church has to get involved, the schools have to be involved, the communities have to be involved. We've got to educate parents. We've got to get everybody involved in trying to make a difference. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for coming here tonight. Um, Dr. Aldis, I have two uh, very related questions. The first is, I'd like to hear your comment on this. I don't know very much about President Clinton's plan. In fact, tonight is really the most detailed explanation of it I've heard. But the little I do know seems to me that what President Clinton has proposed is really an access to insurance plan as opposed to access to health care. Could you comment on that, please? Well, I think a, a very small part of the, uh, you know, well, a big part, let me say, take, take back, of the president's health care plan is to make sure that all Americans have access to health care. I didn't say access to insurance. And a part of that, it was the public health piece. In fact, the president's plan is the only piece that has public health as a major cornerstone and prevention. We have, you know, we have the community health centers, we have the health education, we have the school health initiative to put, really go into the schools and have clinics in the schools. There are community health centers, migrant health centers. All of those are a part of the president's plan and a major part 
part is educating school, our faculty, educating nurses, you know, educating doctors, and keeping our uh, academic health centers up and on par to continue to do research. Otherwise, we can fall further and further behind. So all of those are important components of the president's uh, health care plan. It's not just a plan to provide sick care. So uh, are we working towards a system where very basically if a person is sick, he or she will get health care whether or not they can pay for it? Well, that's true, but it will be the responsibility of the doctors that are taking care of you to keep you well. Everybody, the big emphasis will be on keeping you well. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have a responsibility, if I have a responsibility for a group of people, and then if, I, if, it's a, if we have a capitated system, I want everybody to stay well because if everybody stays well, I get more money. And our prep past system did not pay for prevention. We didn't pay the doctor to sit down and talk to the teenager to keep them from getting pregnant. We didn't pay the doctor to do nutrition counseling. Mm -hmm. We paid for sick care. We did not pay for the doctor to keep people healthy. And I think that's what yeah. we've got to move to. Is there somewhere where we could find out what the president plan, what the president's plan really says? Can, oh, can yes. we get In that fact, information there, Well, there is a, there is a, a book mm -hmm. bill that's like that, and right. then there is a, you know, a book that's about like that. It's called the Health Security Act, and it's uh, out and available at many bookstores okay. even. Thank you. But the big thing is it's guaranteed health insurance. It, you continue to have choice. It makes sure that we reform the insurance system, that we continue to keep Medicare, uh, it, you know, as it is, and offer primary uh, prescription drugs for our you know, patients that are on Medicare. And the other thing is that we feel that everybody should have a responsibility for insurance, that some, that it should, and it should be associated with work. We know that most people's insurance is already associated with their work. Okay. And uh, that if, uh, and that the people, that, and everybody gets taken care of, and many people do not pay. So, uh, so, so that's, those are kind of the round things, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I agree with you that uh, if you want to read about it, I think the best thing to tell you to do is just buy the, you know, buy the book, and it's called Health Security Act. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, and thank you for spending time with us tonight. I'm a nurse who works with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, and am also very active with Nurses for National Healthcare that promotes a single-payer style reform. And I'd like to make a couple of comments and ask a question. Um, one thing that wasn't addressed is what are some of the major forces holding us back from um, attaining a single-payer style of healthcare reform for the country? One that is really proven with more data than you. Could could ever ask for to provide more services to people at lower cost, to have the money go for care instead of to administrative overhead and marketing. Um, and also, poll after poll has shown great public support for this kind of reform. I actually just got in my mailbox today on my way here a wonderful mailing from the Universal Healthcare Action Network that's trying to really form groups nationwide into a grassroots collective effort. As you say, we must work together for these vital issues for our country. And anyone that's interested, there's an 800 number. It's 1-800-634-4442. And it includes professional groups, nurses, doctors, social workers, oh, average citizens. And some of the forces are fighting against this kind of true reform that would really provide care to people well, you know, that need it. I think you might have been alluding to in this humorous phrase of dancing with the bear, which um, I'm wondering, do you mean the insurance industry, which in my opinion is one of the biggest forces holding us back? And if you didn't mean that, what do you mean until you, you say, wait until the bear gets tired? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I think that obviously you have to get whatever health care piece, we have to get it through the Congress. And then, you know, all of your data has to be based on other countries. Just because it worked in Canada does not mean it'll work in America. 
And so I, you know, I think that we have to make sure, you know, so we can't just say, well, this is how theirs work and it, it can transform. We don't see a lot of Americans going to Canada to get health care, but we see quite a few Canadians coming to America to get health care. Well, so we awesome. feel that we know we've got a good basic system, but we've got to find a way to take care of all of our citizens. I think it's also somewhat of a media blitz that's been promoted by the insurance industry about these stories of Canadians. Okay. Okay. And just well, you get out there and get it passed as long you. as everybody's I, taken care okay, of. And I hope we'll all work together on it. The very last thing is just in balance to your um, comment about that nice book that describes the president's um, health plan. There's also a wonderful book called The Guide to National Health Care Reform by Steffi Wohlhandler and David Himmelstein that provides a background and data about single Thanks very much. Good evening, Dr. Elders, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm uh, going to address um, a very controversial issue, and that's the funding of abortion on mm -hmm. the national health care. I'm a, obviously a woman, but also a registered nurse and just completed a research uh, study, and just wondering on your feelings and um, on it, since there, I agree wholeheartedly about pro the prevention and education of the system that, um, of the elements of the system that are offered, but right now there's um, 1.6 million American women that are having them. 95% um, um, are on grounds of birth control. I've seen myself people having multiple of them. There's a real issue of um, people wondering whether they want to pay for something like that. And I think if what you've promoted here tonight of prevention education, <laughs> wouldn't that in itself help um, women who do um, get pregnant um, possibly uh, or not get pregnant oh, or, or Absolutely, and that's just why I've always been mm -hmm. about making sure that we had health education, making sure the contraceptive services were out there and available right. for our women. And what I've always been about is preventing unplanned, unwanted pregnancies. I'm not about abortion. Right. I'm about preventing pregnancy. And I've never known a woman to need an abortion that was not already pregnant. But I do absolutely support the idea to make sure that all reproductive health services are available, that are approved by doctors, that are available for all women. You see now, what, the women that they're most not available for are the young, the poor, and the uneducated. I, I agree. I, if I can just follow up on that, I, I do please, agree please, that. Because we're running out of time. Okay, Thank sorry you. Sorry about that. Um, but just in case of a, like a middle ground even issue, 4% of um, like if there's a mother's health involved rape incest would bring it down to a um, million five hundred thousand and, and I mean that's the number that would consist of that, so it, yeah. it would we, decrease it immensely. What we've got to do is reduce the number of unplanned, unwanted children. That's what we are all about. Thank you for coming and working so very hard on this and please keep President and Mrs. Clinton in mind. We want them to manage this universal health care achievement with you. Second, I, I understand that you are in favor of legalizing drugs, one of our major health problems. Why and how? Well, I don't think I've ever said that I was in favor of legalizing drugs. I said that drugs was a major problem in our society and I felt that we should study it and find out what we should do. I don't know what to do. If I knew what to do, okay. I would say it. But I feel it's a, it's a problem, and I feel that when you've got a problem, you need to study it and try and find answers. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm an occupational therapist, and I work at Spalding Rehab Hospital, and we work um, after doctors and nurses help save people's lives. We help bring them back to life by having them be more independent and take care of themselves again. I'm curious, under the new health care plan, um, how much is covered for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists? All right. Rehabilitation for physical therapists is definitely covered in the health care plan. I was a physical therapist, too, before I became a doctor. So an occupational therapists who oh. help people take care of themselves in terms of that rehabilitation for, and that includes physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, here, as all of us are, because we're concerned. Uh, I'm 73, I'm still working, and uh, I, have, I belong to an HMO primarily because my sister, who's a nurse, and her husband 
uh, on, on Medicare and they have so many forms to fill out that uh, they, every year they have a whole draw full in their filing cabinet of forms for their medical costs. And uh, <clears throat> I last evening had a uh, pulse generator put in, renewed, and uh, the forms that I filled out were really and essentially only just to admit me and have the doctors do the performance. And the question is, how do you expect with the problems with Medicare and, and Medicaid and they're running out of money that we're going to have a system run by the federal government that's going to improve the situation? <laughs> But, uh, well, we, we hope that we can certainly, with all the new computers and everything, we hope we can reduce the paperwork and simplify it, reduce to, to a single form. And, you know, I feel that, you know, we are the federal government. It's not that it out there. And so I feel that, you know, if other people can run an efficient system, we'll have to learn how to. Well, we have time for just two more questions, please. Well, I have two questions. Well, then we'll make it three if you do it quickly. No, no, we'll get you. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming, Dr. Elders. And um, um, my question is that uh, over the past 25 years in my being involved with alternative healing, um, the federal government, particularly the FDA, <clears throat> has been attacking uh, herbalists, uh, uh, homeopaths. Uh, they did. You know, uh, they just confiscated a video that I did for cable on vitamin therapy. The question is, uh, is there any provisions, because I have not heard of any at this point, to work with and include alternative healing methods? I don't know the answer to that, and I've been asked before, and I need to learn the answer, so I just don't know, okay? Okay. The, the second question, um, I spoke with some friends at the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, as you're aware, uh, this weekend at uh, Harvard Law School we have a symposium on crime, drugs, and prevention, which uh, the question is, uh, which they asked me to ask you specifically, if you could lay out and design the means to conduct the studies relative to uh, the possible legalization of drugs. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not a drug person. You know, what I'm saying is, you know, there are a lot of real experts in our country who know an awful lot about drugs, and I'm not one of those persons, but I think there are people out there who could really do that. I think we just, I recommend that we do a study. I still think we need to do a study. I don't know how to do the study. I'm not the expert, okay? Thank you very much. One last question. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Surgeon General. My name is a Childs from a lifelong registered Democrat, I may add, from a Congressman Joe Moakley's district, whom we all respect and admire here in this, in this uh, Commonwealth. Um, now that the health care issue, Madam Surgeon General, uh, is, is on track, don't you think that the president's, uh, the, the, uh, high on the list of President Clinton's List of priorities may be educare, that is uh, education for any child or sin, uh, citizen in this great country who wants it regardless of financial uh, position. Well, I think the president is very concerned and very committed to education. I mean, this has been a life long commitment of his. I think that he's very, he's going to work very hard to uh, fund uh, Head Start, and I know that he's very interested in early childhood education, and I'm sure that he wants to make sure that all bright young people who do well in school and want an opportunity to go to college, that we'll try to fund that, looking at it as an investment in the future of this country. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Elders. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been attentive.